My family's amused that I chose to speak about listening, though they are hopeful that it is a sign of personal growth. <laughs> Today I'm going to talk about three aspects of listening that particularly resonate with me. Listening for learning, listening for kindness, listening for joy. And they may all be the same thing. And we do this listening with our eyes, with our ears, and with our hearts. In Reverend Tom Belote's class on sermon writing this past spring, I learned that what I'm going to share with you today is a sermon of personal journey. Recently, my brother Jesse sent me a link to Destin Sandlin's YouTube program, Smarter Every Day, this link being for the backward brain bicycle. Sandlin, who actually is a rocket scientist, described the day the welders at Redstone, who he says like to place tricks on the engineers, called him down to ride a bicycle on which they'd made only one slight adjustment. We've all heard it's like riding a bike, meaning once you know how, you'll always be able to ride a bike. But with the one small adjustment, Sandlin could not ride the bike without falling off or falling over. The adjustment was simply adding gears at the juncture where the handlebars meet the post that controls the front wheel. Normally, when a bike rider turns the handles to the right, the wheel turns to the front wheel turns to the right. However, with this adjustment, when the handlebars were turned to the right, the front wheel turned to the left. <laughs> the video shows Sandlin taking the bicycle to myriad presentations on several continents and challenging folks to ride it. Not one person could ride this bicycle. Every one of the persons who attempted to ride the bike was someone who had been successfully riding a bike for many years. It took Sandlin himself over eight months to learn to ride the bike, and even after he learned, with the slightest distraction, he'd still fall off the bike. So what does this have to do with listening? G.K. Chesterton said, there's a lot of difference between listening and hearing. And for me, Sandlin's conclusions have everything to do with listening and hearing. He said he learned three things from the bike experience. Welders are smarter than engineers. <laughs> Knowledge does not equal understanding. Truth is truth no matter what I think about it, so be careful how you interpret things because you are looking at the world with a bias whether you think you are or not. First, about the welders being smarter than the engineers. The fact that Sandlin says this indicates, of course, that there's a hierarchy at Redstone on which engineers are placed above welders. The rationale being that engineers are more highly educated, hold higher status jobs, and therefore must be more intelligent. How does this relate to listening? Think about this. If you're walking through the hallways at Duke or UNC hospitals, what assumptions are you making about people? The persons in scrubs with the stethoscopes hanging around their necks? Those in uniforms passing uh, pushing trash carts? The obese woman in a wheelchair? The unkempt man missing most of his teeth? the teenager with patterns shaved in his head and covered with tattoos. If we are honest with ourselves, if one of these people tried to engage us in conversation, which one would we think worthy of making us late for our appointment? Would we see the medical person as having something important to communicate? The housekeeping person as just wanting to kill some time? the woman in the wheelchair as needy, the unkempt man as possibly deranged, or the teenager as dangerous. Truth is, we tend to be willing to listen to people whom we judge to have credibility. And that judgment is often based on what we perceive to be their credentials. Education, appearance, accent, what a mistake that can be. 
Do you know the story about Joshua Bell, world-renowned violinist, currently music director of the Academy of St. Martin's in the Field, who in 2007 played his violin one morning in an arcade outside the Washington, D.C. metro? Visualize this. He was dressed in a ball cap, t-shirt, and blue jeans. His violin case lying open next to him. Of the 1,097 people who passed him, only seven stopped to listen for any amount of time. More might have if they'd known his violin was valued at $3.7 million, <laughs> or that the seats for his performance in Boston three days earlier averaged $100 a seat. After all the publicity this stunt received, his next Metro performance seven years later was announced ahead, and the Metro station was packed with listeners. So while it may be an overstatement to say all welders are smarter than all engineers, clearly it's not an overstatement to say that in terms of deciding to whom we will listen, we make a mistake if we choose to listen only to those we deem to have the appearance of credibility or credentials. We miss opportunities to be kind, we miss opportunities to learn, and we miss opportunities to experience joy. Sandlin's second takeaway from the bike experience is knowledge does not equal understanding. As a principal, I saw many examples of the difference between listening and hearing, knowledge and understanding, and you might think I'm talking about the students, but I'm not. I'm talking about the adults. One teacher was doing a lesson on following directions with her class of third graders. The children sat in rows, facing her as she read aloud her directions for how to draw a clown. When she finished reading the directions, she said to the children, now, if everyone listened very carefully and followed the directions I just led, would all of the clowns look exactly alike? One little guy could barely contain himself, raising his hand, wiggling all over, and the teacher called on him. She repeated the question, would all of the clowns look exactly alike? And he said, no. The teacher looked totally nonplussed and said crossly, well, they certainly would if everyone listened and followed my directions. But of course, it was the student that was correct. On another day, I observed another teacher doing a reading lesson with her second graders. She read the title of the book to them. It happened on a ranch and asked, now, based on the title of this book, what do you think it'll be about? Another little guy, barely able to stay in his seat, was called on. Giraffes, he said. It'll be about giraffes. But this teacher said, tell us why you think it'll be about giraffes. And the child shouted, because I saw a show on TV last night, and it was about a ranch in Africa, and they had giraffes. And while there were no giraffes in this book, the wiggly little guy's answer was absolutely on target and demonstrated a good grasp of thinking and reasoning skills for a, sec for a second grader. The difference between what these teachers did with and to their students are major. The first teacher knew what the child said, but she didn't understand his response. She might have understood had she asked him, tell us why you think the clowns won't look exactly alike. Given him the time to respond and listen closely enough to hear his thinking. I'll tell you, that child didn't raise his hand again in the class during that lesson. And when I talked to the teacher after the lesson, it became clear that was, she was so predisposed to judge this child based on his background and race, poor, black, bust from a housing project, that it was unlikely she would ever be able to understand his true abilities. Ralph Nichols, who did extensive research regarding listening, said, the most basic of all human needs is the need to understand and be understood. The best way to understand people is to listen to them. Clearly, 
That wasn't happening for this little guy. The second teacher knew what the child said, the book would be about giraffes, and like the first teacher, she didn't understand his response. However, this teacher asked, why do you think that? And listened until she understood. Talking with this teacher after the lesson, it was clear that she too had predisposed attitudes about this child, those being, that despite his poverty and hyperactivity, this child could and would succeed, and it was her job to do everything in her power to ensure that. This teacher met her students' needs by listening to them, seeking to understand them, and showing them they were understood. Knowledge is not understanding. If we don't listen, we can do serious damage to another. But if we do listening, but if we do listen, knowledge can become understanding. As author J. Isham said, listening is an attitude of the heart, which both attracts and heals. Sandlin's third point about the bike experience is, truth is truth no matter what I think about it, so be careful how you interpret things because you're looking at this world with a bias whether you think you are or not. About 10 years ago, I did a week-long workshop with a woman named Ruby Payne. Her work focuses on helping privileged middle-class educators understand and respect the strengths and needs of children who are dealing with generational or situational poverty. This was truly transformational for me, and I've had considerable opportunity to translate the knowledge I received from Ruby Payne into understanding as a result of a gift my husband John and I received. This was about five, about five years ago, we became deeply involved with a family that immigrated from El Salvador. The mother of this family, a single mother, works three jobs to keep food on the table and a roof over her children's head. All of her jobs are the kind from which she'll get fired if she takes time off for such luxuries as school conferences or to pick up a sick child from school. So John and I fill in for her with the children. As much as I've learned from work working with these children and as much joy as this has brought us, every once in a while I get a severe jolt. Ruby Payne emphasized the importance of food when you're dealing with families in poverty. Of course, I know that families in poverty deal with tremendous food insecurity. However, it took a considerable amount of time of listening and observation to understand why the girl would only order chicken with broccoli whenever we went to a Chinese restaurant. When we went to our favorite Chinese restaurant, I'd always ask her, would you like to share some of what we're having? The answer was always no. So I judged that she was a picky eater. That was until we started bringing along her 13-year-old brother who will eat anything that's not nailed down. <laughs> After watching her brother, the girl would start with a small taste, then ask for a helping. The understanding finally came to me. When you have a very limited amount of money to spend on food, you only order food you know you'll like, because if you don't like it, you're stuck with it. You can't afford to leave it and order something else. If you don't like it and you don't eat it, you leave the table hungry. And if you leave the table hungry, you may be hungry for a long time because you can't be sure when there's going to be something on the table again. Yes. Truth is truth no matter what I think about it, and I do need to be careful how I interpret things. Because I am looking at the world with my white, middle-class, privileged bias, whether I think I am or not. And I do know that only through listening can I hope to move toward understanding. The seven habits of highly effective uh, people guru, Stephen Covey says, most people do not listen with the intent to understand. They listen with the intent to reply. 
When my dad began to have severe hearing loss and went to Stanford University Hospital Hearing Clinic, he told me the first thing he was taught was to give his full attention to whomever was speaking and not think about what he was going to say in reply. This alone, he said, improved his hearing comprehension almost 50 percentage points. Here at the community church, we practice deep listening without replying in covenant groups and Lectio. The Lectio meditation group meets at noon every Friday in the commons. This is something I look forward to all week long and I would be hard pressed to name any experience from which I have learned more about listening. Listening for kindness, listening for learning, and listening for joy. Some of us have been coming to this group for about eight years. Each week we read a text from one of the world's religious traditions or from poetry. The text is read three times, as we're doing this morning. And each of these three re after each of these three readings, a question is asked, and each person is given opportunity to share a response. This is a form of group meditation, so there's no crosstalk. We don't interrupt each other, argue, give advice, or try to solve one another's problems. Instead, we listen deeply and build on the wisdom of the group as it emerges. We don't comment or correct what one another says. We don't try to fix one another. We simply listen to one another. And this is magical. I love the way my understanding of the reading changes and evolves as I listen to what others say. I would add all members of the congregation are invited and welcome to participate in Lectio. We're not a cliquish group. New people come, some leave, and some who dropped out return. And everyone has something unique and amazing to contribute. Back to the bicycle. Remember when you first learned to ride a bike, the sense of power at having learned this very big girl or big boy thing to do, the exhilaration that you felt when your mom wasn't looking and you went down the hill so fast with the air brushing past your ears you couldn't hear and you felt as if you were flying? For me, the understandings and insights and epiphanies that come during the times I truly listen to another person give me the same sense of exhilaration. However, just as with riding a bike, I need to practice on a regular basis so I don't get rusty and fall over. Finally, I want to leave you with seven points made by researcher and listening legend, the late Dr. Ralph G. Nichols. The most basic of all human needs is to understand and be understood. His second point, it's almost impossible to hate a person whom we fully understand. Third, the best way to understand people is to listen to them. Fourth, we are at the mercy of those who understand us better than we understand them. Five, when people make a decision, it is for their reason not ours. Six, the wise listener is attentive, non-evaluative. He asks only unslanted questions and praises those statements by an adversary which he can honestly praise. And number seven, we must face with courage the fact that when we succeed in hearing a person out, our own position may become modified. And I close with this quote attributed to the Greek philosopher Zeno of Sidium. We have two ears and one mouth, so we should listen more than say. Please stand as you are able and